Humans have been preserving plant and animal products since the dawn of time by drying and storing them carefully in order to have food available for themselves, their family, and their communities during the off seasons for long distance travel and for times of scarcity. Many traditional Navajo foods are still prepared for later use by drying, especially dried steamed corn, sumac berries, and Navajo tea. Let's take a look at some of the most common methods of preservation, specifically food dehydrating. Carol Palmer Yinishe, Irish Nishli, Swedish Bashishin, Scottish Dushiche, Beshpacha Dushanali. Hello, my name is Carol Palmer. I am not Navajo, but I really appreciate being invited to participate in this workshop. And we're going to talk about food preservation from the dehydrating side, drying food. And that is something that has been done for thousands of years. It's what brought us here today. We have some examples here of things that have been dried in some of the traditional foods. So clearly corn is something that always is dried, both for food and seed. And then the nishtiji is there, sunflower seeds, pinyon, chichin, the traditional squash. And squash is something that was traditionally dried. There are many, many things that you can dry. So I have an example of a lot of different things. Squash blossoms were originally dried and tea uh, was dried, wild parsley, um, you know, even things like beans, but also things like strawberries and bananas and melons. These are peppers that I bought on sale in the 99 cent bag, and so I have dehydrated them. And to tell you the truth, they're a couple years old now. I don't go through them very quickly, but they're dried and they last a long time. We've seen the fluctuations in what's available at the grocery store. And so to have a backup, to have some things available to feed your family is people are real recognizing how important that can be. When you're drying food, the biggest challenge is identifying how much moisture is still left in the food. So these were bell peppers that were red and yellow uh, and orange. And they, they snap, they're a little flexible. It's kind of like leather is sort of an ideal consistency to achieve when you're drying food. It doesn't have to be super hard. So these were mushrooms that I got on sale. So you can still kind of see that mushroom shape. And they're a little bendy. Now you could dry them to where they're all the way crisp too. But water carries bacteria. So if there's too much moisture in your dried foods and you put them in a jar, they can get moldy. But even something like a banana, Bananas go on sale quite a bit. People like to make banana bread. This is something that you could dehydrate. And then uh, some people like their chips hard. These ones are still flexible. You can soak these with a little bowl of water and you could still have mushy banana to make your banana bread or any other gum. There are a lot of resources out there. There's a lot of stuff on the internet. So you can look through things and look at different people's approaches and see what idea makes sense to you. And as far as traditional foods, this is the time to still be asking questions of people and see what is out there in terms of information because some of that information is being lost and we really want to make sure that things do get passed down to future generations. But you can also take, especially with the hard squash, not so much with the zucchini, but you can powder it down and then you have, and you, you've seen the, the powders in the stores, but if you already have a squash powder, you can sneak that into anything and your family doesn't need to know that you're making them healthier. When you dry things, it concentrates the sugars in the, it, that are naturally in the food. So even zucchini, once it's like this, it's gonna have a little bit of a sweetness to it that you won't find when you're tasting it when it's, when it's raw. The main things that are lost in this process are a couple of vitamins, vitamin A, vitamin C. I think those are things you can easily obtain from other sources. So if you're worried about that, just balance that out. But otherwise, you've got a product that can be very versatile for you with just a little bit of effort. People buy the powdered greens. I'm not very good at labeling my items, but these were spinach leaves and I have dried them, and they're just loosely in a powder here. People used to collect the wild spinach. There's more than one kind of wild spinach. Right now with the rains, the amaranth is coming out, but this is something that could be 
done, preserved for the future, and then added into stews, added into um, cookies and cakes. You know, you can sneak stuff in anywhere. One of the things that used to be done traditionally was melons, and they would be cut into strips and hung to dry, and that was something I had never heard of before I came to Navajo. So I had to try that out, and it's really good. You end up with a candy, basically, because they're so sweet. When you're dehydrating things, I tend to, to go towards using equipment. You can dry things to the traditional way, just on a rack, or just sometimes if I only have a couple of little things, I'll put them on a plate up somewhere and maybe put a paper towel over it. Why I like using the equipment is that you don't have to worry about dust, you don't have to worry about bugs, and you can have a more of control over the process in a small space. One of the early dehydrators that I purchased was one that I thought looked cool. It was affordable. It was like 45 or $50, and I got it in Gallup. And it has this little vent on top, which I thought was kind of neat. It can adjust the, the airflow. Dehydrators are, tend to come with separate little racks, which are very handy. So we'll go through this in a minute. But it's nice to have the racks. It makes it very flexible in what you do. But this one is only a heating element in the bottom of the dehydrator. And that's not a very efficient process. You're using electricity, but there's no fan to push it, the heat around. And so this can take a really long time, and I was not expecting that. So um, it's something that can be, I think it's more useful for things like spinach or greens uh, because it's very gentle, but it's not very powerful. So after that experience with that dehydrator, I decided I needed to look into something that had some of those qualities, but was going to be more efficient for me. And so, and the thing with this is that it has a dial adjuster for temperature. To dry foods, you've got a certain range that you're going for, and so it's important to make sure that it's not too hot. And usually you're drying foods at about 125 degrees or maybe a little lower to get that constant long temperature. And this has a little fan in the top. So when you plug it in, you're getting the heating element, but you're also getting a blower that will circulate the air through your equipment. And you can purchase things if you wanted to make some kits like fruit leathers and things like that. So you can put one of these on your, on your rack and you've got a thing for fruit leather. You still have the hole in the middle to allow the air to circulate. And then there is another type of a protector. And so you can see where these racks are kind of, kind of have big holes. So depending on what you're doing, you don't need something like this, but it, makes, it can make it easier. That gives it a much tighter surface when you're placing things on there. And then if things get sticky, it's easy to peel them off of this. This is just a plastic. And you could make these out of the um, plastic that's used for crafting even. As long as it's food safe, it's fine and temperature safe. And so this was something I found. It cost me about $20 to get this. It has, it's completely screened in and it has little zipper windows. And so it's meant to be hung. So if you still wanted to dry things outside, but wanted them protected, I think this is a good option. And the top also unzips so I could dry things on the top. Let me pull that out real quick. These sheets that you can buy of, um, that are usually used for crafting. And so I'm just gonna try to figure out how I can do that for these layers. And that way I will dry more of my produce in this. It's meant for leafy greens. This is a store-bought melon. And I just thought it would be good to show you the things to think about when you're drying your food. So essentially, you just take your, your, your melon and get it ready. So we'll get the, get the seeds out. And then with this particular food, this melon, I wouldn't want to eat the peel, so I'm going to take it off.
but you're gonna wanna make your slices about, you're gonna wanna be as consistent as possible with your pieces, and usually your slices are gonna be at least a quarter of an inch to three eighths inch thick, only because of consistency in, in drying. And if you get something too thin, then it's gonna get sticky, and I can already see that. Um, and it's gonna, you can see on the zucchini how thin that got, and this one had a little bit of a thinner center anyway. Once that moisture is out of that fruit or vegetable, it really shrinks. And I'm gonna show you in a minute how much it shrinks. But I'm just gonna do a little bit of this to fill up this tray. And you want, again, air circulation is important. I'm not trying to make any kind of special designs with these. I'm just trying to keep them a particular size. And that one's too fat. So I'm gonna trim it down. And the nice thing too is that any of these scraps, you can just have a fruit salad or just snack on them as you go. Um, you know, you don't need to, the ones that you're not drying can still be eaten. Now these are a little bit big, so this would take longer to dry than what we usually have. But you can see for this size of melon, there aren't a lot of hard and fast rules with this because you say, well, how much do I, you know, how many trays do I need? Well, it depends on how big your melon is. Um, depends on how, how you make your slices. All of those different little factors that, that might change. Something like that, just as far as trying to get uh, an even distribution and some space between your different fruits. So I did some in advance so you could see these are not done yet. This is a half of a melon. Right now it's down to that shrunk to that size, but they're not done drying, they're not done dehydrating. I put this on yesterday at two o'clock in the afternoon, and then they were drying for until eight o'clock in the morning before I packed them up. So that's already 18 hours, is that the math? Um, and they're still too bendy, they're still too mushy. But some of them are already kind of sticking, the ones that were a little thinner, and you can see how they change. But they're not done yet, they're gonna need a, at least a couple more hours and maybe longer. So watermelon is similar, but of course it's called, it's called watermelon, so there's a lot more water. These are the first ones that I started yesterday morning at eight o'clock in the morning. They're almost done, but they're still really wet. We've had rain, the air is more humid than we usually have, so they're, they're still very sticky, too sticky. If I were to peel these off now and try to put them into a jar, they're gonna get moldy very quickly. But you can see where, what I was saying about having that extra rack, those are smaller pieces. If they really shrink, they could go through those holes. So having this flexible mat is very helpful. They, they are, I can feel the sugar, feel the stickiness. When I prepared these, I cheated and I bought the store already partially cut ones. So I only started with a cube maybe this size and then cut it into halves or thirds. So this would have been an original down to that. So these ones that went in and were only in for seven hours, you can see they're closer in the size and you can still see the translucence of the, the water. There's a lot, a lot of water, but these are gonna be like candy when they're done. Once this is done, I would let them sit on the tray for a little bit longer to really cool down to room temperature. And then I would see how they were doing and peel them off. If they're still a little too sticky, I might just redistribute them on a couple of trays and dry them again because you can see how much smaller they're becoming. I can consolidate my trays and have that so that I'm not using a whole big old stack. I can use just a couple of, of trays 
and continue to, to slowly and gently dry them down. I can adjust the temperatures on these um, dehydrators. I could just leave them to air dry in my kitchen uh, with a paper towel over them or something. But you want them down to the point where they're still going to be um, maybe a little sticky, but there's not going to be that moisture. They're going to be leathery. They're not going to be squishy. People that are into raw foods might draw, draw, use lower temperatures and dry it longer to maintain more of that nutrition. If uh, 125 degrees doesn't work for you or 120 degrees, you can try 135. Usually fruits and vegetables are not dried at a higher temperature than that. But again, do your research and look into what other people are doing and what makes sense to you. But I find this to be a very efficient method of drying food rather than building racks and having things outside where they might get um, contaminated with other things. So my name is Carol Palmer and thank you for being a part of this garden series with us. And I hope that we've inspired you to experiment and explore and try some things. And we'd love to hear how it goes for you. Yeah. <laughs>